Welcome to What That Means with Camille. In this series, Camille asks top technical experts to explain, in plain English, commonly used terms in their field. Here is Camille Moorhart. So hello and welcome to In Technology podcast. Today I have Ardi Aryanpur on from Seekster and I'm going to let him define what the company does. But we are going to be focused on digital health and personalized medicine or precision medicine. And Ardi can help us understand the difference and similarity between the two. Welcome, Ardi. Thanks so much, Camille, for having me here on your wonderful podcast. You're part of sort of digital health and unlocking data and de-siloing data in the digital health space. Can you tell us a little bit more about what Seekster does? Seekster is a healthcare technology company where we pioneered the longitudinal health record for patients. We put the patient at the center of healthcare in order to disrupt or break down the silos, as you mentioned, from EMR, EHR data to your baseline genetic genomic data to your wearable medical device, remote patient monitoring data. And we're not limited to just those data sources. We've built an interoperability technology and a data refinery engine that hits on the intersection of technology and healthcare. It's a operating system for healthcare. An EMR, EHR, electronic medical record, electronic health record, if anybody's not familiar. It used to be that, you know, you go to the doctor's office or the hospital, and if you needed any kind of lab test or you needed one specialist weighing in on another specialist or back and forth between primary care, it was like, fax this piece of paper over here, or I'm sorry, I have to retake the x-ray because I can't trust the x-ray from the other place, or it can't really come in transit at the quality that I need it to. And now... Not only are we looking at a time when those things can be transmitted efficiently digitally, but we're also adding on this concept of like remote monitoring. Can you just lay that foundation rather than how you're tackling it specifically, but what are all of the different ways that medical data can be collected digitally and transferred digitally today? I would first start off with just the foundation of data itself. Various different EMRs or electronic medical record systems or EHRs, electronic health record systems, such as Epic, Allscripts, McKesson, Meditech, Practice Fusion. There's about 28 major ones in the United States. And one reason why our healthcare is so fragmented is because those systems don't actually talk to one another. When you're a patient, or you're a physician or clinician, and you're trying to deal with care coordination, it's very hard to get data from one system to another system if you're moving across the country or going to a specialist for the first time or whatever that scenario or intervention might be on the medical side. But more importantly, about two and a half decades ago, there was something that was passed called HIPAA. And HIPAA is a law that the P within HIPAA stands for portability, but they never actually made the data portable. So what Seekster did out in uh, 2016, when we founded the company, we had this idea of bringing together all of your health records from one place, all of your DNA data from another place, all of your medical device data or your Garmin watch and your Apple watch data that don't talk to one another because of that same interoperability issue into one place and visualize that data for the patient and caregiver. This by accident fell in our lap and we created what some of your listeners probably know in the fintech world as mint.com for your finances, where you're able to see your Wells Fargo, Bank of America, student loans, and you see your net worth. Well, we asked the question at Seekster, what about your net health? And so we created the mint.com for healthcare. But instead of you bringing together, obviously, your banking information, which is just zeros and ones, and that's not that hard 
technically to do. Our engineers crack the code on this interoperability problem where these systems don't talk to one another and we built a data refinery on the back end that standardizes and harmonizes all of the ICD-9 and ICD-10 and all of those codes that are within our medical system. So did the systems not talk to each other because they had some sort of incentive not to, because they were trying to keep the records separate, or did they not talk just because they were doing their own thing and there was no special incentive to talk to each other? I wouldn't say it was on purpose, but I also wouldn't say that the health systems did not go above and beyond their pay grade, I guess you could say, to collaborate to make it easier for patients. And that's why in the US, we have this interoperability issue where McKinsey, the big consulting company, has estimated anywhere between a 35 to $40 billion ballooning annual problem for healthcare. I think it's much higher than that. I don't know what the current figures are, but that's because there's been hundreds and millions of medical devices that have been launched in the last decade. There's been hundreds and millions of wearables that have been launched. Those things don't even talk together. There's new medical practices, doctor clinics, dermatology offices, optometry offices that don't talk to the health system. It's very fragmented. So Artie, if I'm a patient and I'm accessing my dashboard through a portal or something, does this cost me anything? Doesn't cost you money. How do we make money is probably the better question. It's subsidized. Let's say we have a deal with Nova Nordisk. Let's say we have a deal with whoever, Coca-Cola for their employees. You get it through them. However, when I first started, we built the direct-to-consumer application and we pivoted after Bill Gates actually called me and he told me, you guys have an operating system. This isn't a platform. You know, after that, we pivoted to the Seekster OS and we built this operating system. But you can try it yourself if you go on your desktop and go to app.seekster. It's completely free, never charged. You can even go check it out. You don't even need to connect any data of it. If you do, you can see what it looks like. So I want to look at sort of, well, at least what I would consider for many people would be kind of the scary side of what you're talking about. I know even I wonder, you know, I have this sort of health watch situation and I also wear my regular one a lot of the time, old school. When you're starting to talk about collecting data, even while I sleep or looking for like heart arrhythmias or even like ergonomic tracking kinds of data that could be collected through like what I'm doing on my PC. And that's being gathered. Even if I have control over it, it's being gathered, it's being aggregated. And then there's a potential for that to be shared across health providers, across technology companies, across maybe even insurance. Are concerns legitimate? Are they rational? And what kinds of things are being done in general? I mean, it doesn't necessarily yeah. have to be Seekster, but just in general, like what kinds of ways are we protecting that type of data? That's super valid what you bring in privacy and security are of concern. And it was also a heavy investment that we made at the beginning. I'll share something with the audience and you that most people, I would say 99.9% .9 of folks, if not higher, do not know. So you probably heard of certain breaches within healthcare systems. There's certain breaches of data that happen. And one reason why that happens, I'll give you an example. Kaiser being one of our biggest healthcare systems in the state of California has around 11.7 million patients. They have one encryption code for all those 11.7 million patients. So if there's a breach, there's access to a vast majority of the data. With Seekster, we knew that. And it's not just Kaiser. That's any health system, whether that's a health system that's 100,000 people or if it's MD Anderson that has a million people about. They all have this problem because how they were built from the beginning. They're not going to just shut down their practice and shut down the EMRs 
and then launch a whole new thing. And I'll tell you why. With Seekster, the best way to actually encrypt data is the moment of collection. We built and we've improved and progressed on the encryption. We have 256-bit encryption. We have bank-level security there. And more importantly, if you have one patient or 11.7 million patients like Kaiser, you have one encryption identifier for that one patient or 11.7 million different types of encryptions because the moment of collection happens at the patient level. Now, you can't expect health systems to take the same exact stance because they're not really direct to consumer. They're a provider, they're a health system. So their business is different. Our technology and our model, how we made it more secure than your current health system says something about where technology is headed. So the companies that are supporting you then, the pharma, Big Pharma, for example, you listed off, how are they benefiting from it? They're using it as a patient engagement tool for all their clinical trials to advance precision medicine, to advance personalized medicine, to advance drug development. So the patient gets something back within the trial, meaning they get to track and monitor their health data, and the patient gets to give consented data to that trial. Is the ultimate goal kind of this predictive medicine or just health monitoring? And are you going to use AI to kind of look for patterns and trends? We are definitely interested in, you know, doing the right things with AI. There's a lot that can be done within healthcare because of physician burnout, patient burnout, and just finding certain things that you couldn't find before. There are current examples such as when you go get a colonoscopy, there's a live clinician, a GI doc, looking at your colon, and they can miss things. AI might find something that that person missed with the naked eye. That's a great example of AI actually in medicine. And the reason being is because they're able to layer that AI on top of the data. This is happening also for breast cancer and breast screenings. There's multiple different examples of that within medicine and precision medicine. But, you know, when you're looking at the data, the more data you have, the more you can pump out, the more analytics and AI becomes more valuable. So there's been kind of a trend or a little bit of a trend toward AI using distributed models in the healthcare space, like federated learning, where we can say, okay, hey, patient data can remain literally in the hospital where it was collected through that imaging system. And then we'll use aggregators and go train central models. But your data, your raw data, health data never leaves the location, never goes into the cloud. And people cite that as a security priority. So it sounds to me like you're talking about the opposite, where you are aggregating all of this data. The raw data is leaving the places where it was collected, either your wrist or Fitbit style thing or the hospital or the genome lab. Which model is going to prevail or will it depend on the use case or will they both grow? It's dependent on the use case. It's dependent on the disease. It's dependent on the patient. It's dependent on the caregiver. It's dependent on the person. All those things relate to, obviously, the use case. Is that going to change in the near future? I don't see that changing from our vantage point. Maybe some others do, and that's okay. But from our experience, it's completely dependent on the use case. What use cases do you think will remain distributed or federated and which would be aggregated? Yeah, longitudinal data tracking, post-market surveillance. What's that? Your physician changes your drug for whatever reason, maybe because it has better efficacy, maybe because it's better personalized for you, because now we have all this data and we can make better decisions based off the person, not just off of a pharma company selling us a brand name. Drugs should be personalized to you. Medicine should be personalized to you, but that can't really be unless you actually have a 360-degree view of a patient. 
And when you aggregate this data from multiple different sources, from multiple different providers that you've had within your care journey or patient journey, the intervention becomes a lot easier. It becomes a lot more clear and decisions can be made a lot quicker too. One thing that I'm really fond of is I stand by the saying of health data is medicine. The same way that people say food is medicine, right? I believe, and we believe at Seekster because we've seen it firsthand with our technology saving people's lives because we were able to run a tumor board in six hours and get a patient into surgery within less than a week. And then they were able to remove that 52 millimeter tumor out of their ascending colon and dodge cancer being metastasized. You know, that's saving a life. So data, health data is medicine because of certain examples like that. And we see that across different use cases. For sure, oncology, it gets really complicated when you're going into dementia and Alzheimer's. And that's another big segment in the US that's, I think, is going to be the most growing disease in the next two, three decades because of our aging population. And there's a lot of silver tech, they call it, that's trying to solve those problems. But what they're forgetting is how do you get all the data in a common form? I had personally two grandmothers that passed away to, due to Alzheimer's disease. How much is my data worth? What if I was able to share my data with your family? We're not related, but maybe my data can help your family because you guys might be going through the same patient journeys. So all this defragmentation of healthcare really affects a domino effect around, you know, not just patients and, and the home and, you know, everything, but overall, just the well-being of our country. So do you think that there's a future for if I have sovereignty over my own data, even if a platform is collecting it or aggregating it for me, is there a space where I can monetize that. When we started Seekster, we wanted it to be all about consented data. Number one, it had to be about data ownership. So you own the data, we don't own it. And number two, um, it had to be you know shareable in a transparent form. There's been lots of different talks and we've had ideas around a marketplace for health data so that folks like my mom, who's a breast cancer survivor, could donate her data and get paid for her data. But how would she actually do that, right? Who's the broker? How is she going to collect her data? How is she going to be able to even know about some sort of thing like this? And so there's a lot of education there on that. Everyone's kind of thinking about this around their health data. And the reason being is because they know that it's personable and they know that it's valuable. You don't really think about that when you're sharing your pictures on Instagram or your posts on LinkedIn, because how valuable is it? Maybe it's worth, you know, pennies or I don't know, maybe dollars, but your health data is actually worth a lot. It costs $168,000 to keep someone in a clinical trial. I do have another question that's kind of related to access. So for people who are distrustful of big tech or big pharma, what kind of guarantees do they have that they still have top access to healthcare, even if they're not interested in having their records aggregated or shared? The beauty of that is it's, it's your data. You own it. You control it. You can use it still and consent not to share it. It doesn't need to be shared. So that's where the digital consent that we built within the system comes in handy. Whether we're powering any enterprise as a white label and the consented data is what's being you know, used and shared in a de-identified way. Okay, yeah, true. I think we probably should have noted that before. Even if you're sharing information, it's been anonymized or it's been de-identified in such a way as it can't be associated with you, the individual, you associated with your name. Good point. 
all the data is de-identified and all the data is encrypted. Thank you, Ardi Arianpour, CEO and co-founder of Seekster. I really appreciate your insight today into digital health and also personal or precision medicine, as well as your definition of the difference between the two. Personally, I'm looking forward to more and more conversations about the intersection between biology and healthcare and technology. I think that this is really leading edge, cutting edge stuff uh, that also comes with a certain amount of apprehension and ethics and privacy considerations. So I really want to make sure we carefully go through some of these conversations. Appreciate your insight today and your opinion, Artie. Never miss an episode of What That Means with Camille by following us here on YouTube or search for In Technology wherever you get your podcasts. The views and opinions expressed are those of the guests and author and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Intel Corporation. Intel Corporation.